Greetings and welcome to the Hibbit Sports first quarter 2022 earnings conference call. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone. If at any time during the conference you need to reach the operator, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Friday, May 28, 2021. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Jason Fructel, Director of Finance and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning. Please note that we have prepared a slide deck that we will refer to during our prepared remarks. The slide deck is available on Hibbit.com via the Investor Relations link found at the bottom of the homepage or at Investors.Hibbit.com. These materials may help you follow along with our discussion this morning. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that some of management's comments during this conference call are forward-looking statements. These statements, which reflect the company's current views with respect to future events and financial performance, are made in reliance on the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 and are subject to uncertainties and risks. It should be noted that the company's future results may differ materially from those anticipated and discussed in the forward-looking statements. Some of the factors that could cause or contribute to such differences have been described in the news release issued this morning in the company's annual report on Form 10-K, the most recent quarterly report on Form 10-Q, and other filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We refer you to those sources for more information. Also, to the extent non-GAAP financial measures are discussed on this call, you may find a reconciliation on, uh, to the most directly comparable gap measures on our website. Lastly, I would like to point out that management's remarks during the conference call are based on information and understandings believed accurate as of today's date, May 28, 2021. Because of the time-sensitive nature of this information, it is the policy of Hibbit Sports to limit the archived replay of this conference call webcast to a period of 30 days. The participants on this call are Mike Longo, President and Chief Executive Officer, Bob Volke, Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Jared Briskin, Senior Vice President and Chief Merchant, Bill Quinn, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Digital, and Ben Knighton, Senior Vice President of Operations. I will now turn the call over to Mike Longo. Uh, thanks, Jason. Good morning and welcome to Hibbett's Q1 Earnings Call. Uh, if you're following along using the slide deck, I'm on the third slide entitled Introduction. Uh, this quarter was a terrific outcome from a financial perspective for the company. As you saw in the press release, we reported an increase of 87% for comparable sales, and the components of that were 113% for brick and mortar, and e-commerce was 1%. Uh, this resulted in operating income of just over $110 million and diluted earnings per share of $5. These results were made possible, of course, by the hard work of our 10,000 teammates in the stores, the store support center, and the distribution center. As always, they helped lead us through another quarter in a challenging business environment. We are proud to represent our teammates today and wanted to make sure to thank them for a job well done. We believe that our results put us on track to significantly outperform our previously announced fiscal year guidance. Uh, later, Bob Bulky will address that new guidance. But first, I want to highlight some of the reasons for the strong Q1 performance. Several factors last year gave both new and existing customers even more reasons to shop with us. This included competitive closures, increased e-commerce adoption, spending rotation into our product categories, and of course, fiscal stimulus. As a result, we believe we have increased our market share. The momentum from these factors gave us even more opportunities to attract and retain new consumers, and our data shows that we've done a good job retaining them so far. Um, let's talk a little bit more about sales drivers on slide four. As we stated previously, our competitive advantage, advantages of service, selection, and a best-in-class omni-channel capability provide us with a strong and resilient business model that continues to satisfy our existing customers while also attracting and retaining new customers without sacrificing our ability to deliver a premium consumer experience. We continue to update and expand our product assortments, improve our supply chain capabilities, and enhance our overall consumer experience, both in-store and online. Our first quarter results exceeded expectations, uh, both in sales growth as well as a strong gross margin performance. 
Some of the key contributors to these results included, uh, first of all, delivering a number of business model improvements earlier than anticipated. Uh, those include things like supply chain innovations, continued emphasis on the store culture, uh, and numerous other investments that will provide future benefits. Uh, another of those factors uh, were that we continue to see large increases in new customers and gains in customer retention. Next, uh, we saw existing consumer shopping frequency and continued order value increases. Uh, as well, competitive closures and limited distribution had a larger impact than projected. And finally, of course, we had stimulus payments that not only came on early, but were more significant than anyone probably forecast. Uh, and as a reminder, we did not put that in our guidance previously. Uh, the combination of these factors drove higher sales, which allowed us to maintain a high gross margin and provide si significant leverage on our SGNA. So moving on to slide five, I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into the next few quarters. Of course, some of the factors mentioned previously are temporary, while others will persist into the future and could significantly improve our opportunity to drive incremental sales and profitability. We believe these factors that will have a lasting imp impact into the future include continued improvements in our business model, additional investments in the consumer experience, new customer retention, capitalizing on competitive closures and reductions in distribution of key brands, and improved inventory position. Uh, that last factor, improved inventory position, uh, warrants a little bit of additional discussion. Uh, we estimate our inventory position at the end of the first quarter was approximately 80 to $100 million below where we wanted it to be uh, in order to support customer demand. And that shortfall cost us sales. We expect to make progress toward achieving our desired inventory levels in the coming months. When our inventory position improves, we expect that the increased revenue from a higher in-stock position will provide the opportunity to deliver incremental sales that will help mitigate much of the drag when the benefit of the temporary factors fades. I'll now turn over the call to Jared to discuss our merchandising performance. Thank you, Mike. If you turn to the merchandising slide, we have incredible results across all categories, including triple-digit gains in apparel. Team sports recovered nicely from the COVID declines in the year ago period, also achieving triple digit growth. All genders saw significant growth led by our women's business, which grew triple digits. Our toe to head merchandising strategy and consumer focus continue to impact our results positively. Strong cross category connectivity led to increases in average unit retail and items per sale. As a reminder, we announced a structural change to our merchandising organization last November realigning our leadership and teams to be more consumer focused across categories organized by men's, women's, kids and team sports, and city gear. This structural change throughout our buying, planning, and allocation teams has enabled us to more closely align and focus our assortments to our consumers. <clears throat> we believe that we have made significant progress in our execution, and while our results have been fantastic, we are just starting to deliver assortments driven from this organizational change, which gives us confidence as we look forward. Apparel business was up triple digits. All apparel categories included branding apparel, fashion apparel, licensed apparel, and accessories, all were up triple digits. All genders were significantly positive. From the athletic brands, we continue to see strong demand for athleisure, loungewear, and performance product. Flooded color connectivity between tops and bottoms Tall to small connectivity and sneaker connectivity were our primary drivers. Our fashion brand business continued to be exceptional. Continued expansion of denim and collections with strong connectivity to sneakers drove our results. Licensed business was explosive during the quarter as investments in jerseys and hats tied to our toe to head merchandising strategy continued its recent strong performance. Accessory business remained very strong with sunglasses, socks, underwear, and sneaker accessories driving the business. Footwear business was up in the low 70s with strong results across basketball, lifestyle, slides, and performance. All genders were significantly positive with women's growth outpacing men's and kids. Basketball, lifestyle, and slides were the standout categories in the quarter. Classic footwear and launch product continued to be in high demand. 
Casual shoes, as well as slide and sandals, were also standouts for the quarter. Specific to footwear and apparel, our women's business was our fastest growing area with triple digit sales. Men's grew in the low 80s and kids in the high 60s. The increased sales and supply chain disruption continue to pressure inventory. While our results are fantastic, our inventory levels are not allowing us to provide a consumer experience to our standards and have likely led to missed opportunity. Our merchants continue to work to fill this void and we've received significant focus from our vendor partners regarding opportunities to improve our inventory position. Based on current projections, we expect inventory levels to be up in comparison to fiscal 20 as we head into back to school, but still below fiscal 19 levels. And now Bob will take you through the financial results. Thanks, Jared, and good morning. If you will, please refer to the seventh slide titled First Quarter Fiscal 2022 Results. As a reminder, our results include both Hibbit and City Gear and are reported on a combined basis. For the first quarter, total net sales increased 87.8% to $506.9 million and consolidated comp sales increased 87.3%. This compares to first quarter fiscal 2021 sales of $269.8 million and a comp sales decline of 19.5%. Over a two-year period, our comp sales increased 51.4%. Brick and mortar comp sales were robust during the first quarter and came in at 113.5% versus fiscal 2021 and a 45.7% increase relative to the first quarter of fiscal 2020. E-commerce comp sales were essentially flat with a 1% increase compared to last year's first quarter, but reflected a 106.4% comp versus the first quarter of fiscal 2020. As a reminder, our stores were only open to the public for approximately 60% of the available days in the prior year first quarter, which drove a significant amount of business to the online channel. As a result, e-commerce sales accounted for 11.7% of net sales in the current quarter, compared to 22.3% in the prior year first quarter. However, the current quarter mix of e-commerce sales is still approximately 340 basis points higher than the first quarter of fiscal 2020. Our GAAP gross margin expanded significantly to 41.4% of net sales compared to 27.5% in the prior year first quarter. This approximate 1,390 basis point improvement was due to higher initial sell-through, a low promotional environment, a mixed shift away from e-commerce sales which carry a lower margin due to incremental fulfillment costs, leverage of store occupancy expenses, and a decline in non-cash inventory valuation reserves related to a lower of cost or market lower cost or net realizable value consideration. In the prior year, incremental non-cash inventory reserve expenses were recorded as a result of uncertainty brought about by the pandemic. Our current quarter gross margin of 41.4% is comparable to the non-GAAP gross margin of 29.4% reported in the prior year, which was adjusted to exclude 5.1 million of non-cash inventory reserve adjustment. Store operating, selling, and administrative expenses, excluding depreciation and amortization, were 18.1% of net sales in the first quarter, which was well below the 33.1% reported in the first quarter of fiscal 21. In addition to leverage gained from the strong sales performance, the prior year included significant non-cash impairment expenses for goodwill, trade name, and select store assets brought about by uncertainty related to COVID, plus several hundred thousand dollars of city gear acquisition and integration activities. Excluding these pandemic-related impairment and valuation costs and certain city gear acquisition and integration expenses, prior year SG&A expenses on a non-GAAP basis were 23.9%. Thus, the current year SG&A expense rate of 18.1% represents an approximately 580 basis point decrease versus the adjusted prior year first quarter result. This decrease was primarily due to leverage from the significant sales increase. Depreciation and amortization increased approximately 1.2 million from last year, reflecting increased capital investments on organic growth opportunities and infrastructure projects. On a gap basis, we generated 110.2 million of operating profit, or 21.7% of net sales, which compares to last year's operating loss of 22.1 million. Excluding all non-GAAP adjustments during last year's first quarter, our 110.2 million of operating income this year compared to operating income of $7.8 million in the first quarter of fiscal 21. GAAP diluted earnings per share were $5 for this year's first quarter, and we did not identify any non-recurring items in our current quarter results. In last year's first quarter, GAAP loss per share was $0.92, cents and adjusted diluting er diluted earnings per share were $0.31. Cents. 
driven by strong sales, robust margins, leverage of SG&A expenses, and a reduction in our inventory balance over the last three months, we generated operating cash flow of $107.1 million during the current quarter compared to $3.9 million of operating cash flow in the prior year first quarter. We spent approximately $7 million in capital expenditures, which were largely related to new, relocated, and remodeled stores. In the prior year first quarter, capital expenditures were approximately $4.1 million. Turning to the balance sheet, we ended the quarter with $270.9 million in cash and cash equivalents up from $209.3 million at the beginning of the quarter and $106.2 million a year ago. Our entire $75 million of borrowing capacity remains available, but we do not anticipate the need to borrow from our secured credit line based on current cash projections. Net inventory ended the quarter at $182.4 million, or 9.7% down from the beginning of the quarter, and a 24.6% decline from last year's ending balance. The continued strong sales in both the brick-and-mortar and online channels, in addition to ongoing constraints in the supply chain, drove the decrease in our inventory position. As Mike mentioned earlier, we feel we will start to see inventory balances rise over the next several months. During the first quarter, the company repurchased 541,283 shares of common stock at a cost of $37.3 million under our authorized share repurchase plan. As disclosed earlier this morning, our board has increased our share repurchase authorization by $500 million in response to confidence in our projected financial performance and the related cash flow generation. Next, I review our updated fiscal 2022 guidance on the A slide titled Updated Guidance. Given the strong results for the first quarter, we are revising our full year outlook for fiscal 2022, which ends on January 29, 2022. This update is influenced by several factors. As we have previously mentioned, we attract and retain new customers throughout fiscal 21 due to pent up demand, market disruption, and government stimulus payments. We feel we continue to attract and retain additional new customers in fiscal 22. We expect that accelerating consumer adoption of e-commerce will continue to drive growth across our best-in-class omni-channel platform. Those factors, in addition to our strong vendor relationships and targeted purchases by our merchandising team, have us well-positioned to take advantage of expected increases in our business. Double-digit store growth, improved the, improving the in-store consumer experience, in addition to supply chain and selling initiatives, should also help drive sales growth as well. We are now forecasting comp sales for the full year in a range from positive high single digits to positive low double digits. This is up from previous guidance of negative low single digits to positive low single digits. Relative to last year, the first quarter represented the easiest comp for the year, and earlier guidance did not include government stimulus payments that landed during the quarter. Also, as a reminder, the benefit we expect to experience from the closure of JCPenney and stage stores will lap during the third quarter. We now expect gross margin performance will be lower over the next three quarters than what we experienced in the first quarter of fiscal 22 due to an expected increase in our inventory position, headwinds on freight and shipping costs, and a potential increase in promotional activity. However, we expect gross margin will be favorable to both gap and adjusted fiscal 2021 gross margin percentages on a full-year basis. Our previous guidance indicated a year-over-year -year decline in gross margin performance on a gap basis. We continue to expect to deliver SG&A leverage on a full-year basis compared to both GAAP and adjusted SG&A reported in fiscal 2021, but we believe SG&A as a percent of sales will increase over the next three quarters in comparison to the first quarter of fiscal 2022 due to wage and related benefit impacts, performance-based incentive and equity costs, and increased costs in categories such as travel and insurance. Lastly, diluted EPS is now forecasted to be in the range of $8.50 to $9 versus our previous outlook that projected diluted EPS of $5 to $5.50. Our diluted EPS forecast assumes an effective tax rate of approximately 25% and a weighted average diluted share count of approximately $16.9 million. We do not anticipate the difference between our GAAP results and non-GAAP results will be material for the current fiscal year. From a capital expenditure perspective, we continue to target investments of 45 to 50 million focused on organic growth opportunities that we believe will lead to incremental sales and profitability, and also on strategic infrastructure projects that will enhance our distribution and back office efficiency. We believe that these investments will assist in attracting new customers, retaining new and existing customers, enhance the consumer experience in stores and online, and modernize our technology and processes. In addition to our capital expenditure plans, we intend to opportunistically allocate capital to share repurchases and currently have approximately $599 million available under our expanded share repurchase program 
following the expansion of our share program earlier today. We expect to provide longer term financial and operational targets and additional insight into our compelling product offerings and customer centric culture during our first formal investor day that will take place on June 24th. We look forward to your attendance at that event. That concludes our prepared remarks. Operator, please open the line for questions. Thank you. If you would like to register a question or comment, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. One moment, please. The first question comes from Sam Poser of Williams Training. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, do you, you don't, I assume that within your guidance, given – well, first of all, can you give us some idea of how May is looking? Has the momentum continued um, uh, quarter to day? Hey, Sam, it's Bob. Um, again, I think, you know, obviously we've had strong momentum ending the first quarter. You know, you can expect that, uh, you know, we continue to feel pretty positive about the outlook. Uh, we're not going to get into any specific, you know, month by month uh, performance at this point. But uh, again, I think, uh, you know, as we've said earlier, pretty pretty positive about what we feel the future looks like. And then, from a from a SG&A perspective, do do you? Uh, I assume that you're. It doesn't mean you're going to leverage every quarter, and Q2 is probably the most difficult to compare. So, could we assume that you'll delever Q2 and then, you know, potential NC leverage in the other quarters? Is that a, is that a good way to think about it? Again, not going to get into the specific quarter by quarter, but you know, yes, last year, you know, as we said, the easiest comp was Q1. The toughest comp was clearly Q2. Um, you know, we still think that you know we can do a lot of good things from an SG&A leverage standpoint, but it is a little bit, um, you know, different from quarter to quarter. But again, we, we're just looking more to full year guidance at this point. Okay. And then, can you, get, you you talked about your new customer retention? Can you give us some some details on the uh, uh, on on sort of on your uh, on the MVP program, how many people, how many people you got this year, how many people are shopping twice, you know, more than once. Uh, you sort of talked about in general terms. If you could give us some color, more specific, that would be greatly helpful. Hi, Sam. It's it's Bill. Um, so we had a record number of people sign up uh, this quarter to our loyalty program. Uh, we also had a record number of new members shopping um, in the program. So not only an increased level of new member shopping, but also more transactions for those new members, as well as a higher transaction value. Um, we've been following those new members uh, starting last May when we started to gain those uh, new members. And uh, so far we've seen lower levels of attrition versus prior year and even the year before that. Um, so we are effectively keeping new customers better than we ever have before. Uh, part of that is, of course, having a wonderful uh, in-store and online experience. Uh, the other piece of that is we have their information. Our files have grown by millions in terms of email, push, uh, text. So we're able to effectively communicate with them like never before. Um, and part of that is our loyalty program where we incentivize them, of course, to make more trips. Great. And then um, you got a lot of cash on the balance sheet. Um, how how are you going? Uh, you know, you, and you did just you know raise the buyback authorization, but outside of the buyback and the store remodels, um, how and and openings? How how you know? Are there other things you're looking at for use of that cash? I think again, first and foremost, we want to replenish inventory values. That's that's going to be one of our big, you know, use of cash. And obviously, as you replenish inventory, that generates more business. So it, it kind of becomes a little bit cyclical. But you know, we targeted again the 45 to 50 million dollars in capital expenditures, which, as you touched on, is geared heavily toward you know the front end of the house, so the store uh, aspect. Um, you know, again, we, we we still feel like there's a, there's opportunity in the marketplace to uh, continue to invest in ourselves from uh, you know additional capital, additional inventory, and additional share repurchase opportunities. So that's that's basically the trifecta of, of uh, capital allocation. Hey, Sam, this is Mike. I'd, I'd like to add a couple of comments. Hope you're doing well today. Um, look, we uh, I think everyone noticed that CapEx has virtually doubled 
uh, from our run rate in previous years. And that's a recognition of the fact that we have an opportunity to significantly invest in the consumer experience, both in brick and mortar as well as the omni-channel experience. And we think that we're in the early innings of that investment. You know, from the things that Ben is doing in the stores to get the sales culture embedded, uh, we think that we're very, very early in that process. The results are remarkable, and um, all the things that Bill is doing in the omni-channel experience and the incessant uh, obsession with making it perfect, and we're never, we'll never be perfect, but that is the goal, he continues to increase the loyalty program, the raffle program, um, and all of those aspects that make that the best in class omni channel experience. And um, while we, we love where we're at, we're nowhere near where we're gonna be. So I am I'm very bullish on the future and those investments. I've got two more. One, your double digit store unit growth and on the press release it said by banner, does that mean that you'll open at least 20 new stores net this year, and that's up from 10 prior. Is, did I, am I correct about that? Uh, yeah, north of that. So you're right. We have said we'll do double-digit unit growth in the Hibbit brand and double-digit unit growth in the City Gear brand, and those are net of whatever few closures we'll have this year. Okay, and then um, thank you. Uh, uh, I'll come back. Uh, I'll come back for more um, in a second. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Alex Perry, Bank of America. Hi. Thanks for taking my question, and uh, congrats on another exceptional quarter. Um, Thank you. Just first, how, how should we think about uh, comps in the second quarter in particular? with the lapping of the stimulus benefits from last year, you know, maybe partially offset by the child tax credit benefits that, you know, seem to be coming. And then just specifically with uh, uh, on the inventory, are you seeing a shift in sort of the launch calendar from 1Q to 2Q given the inventory delays? And um, just off of that, like how much of a drag was inventory this quarter and how much of it, how is it expected to continue to be a drag in the second quarter? Hey, Alex, good morning, it's Jared. Uh, you know, certainly we're up against some, uh, a very difficult quarter, certainly in the second quarter, but, you know, we're real confident. Uh, the improvements we made in the company, uh, certainly our trend, um, we do expect access to inventory to continue to improve um, as some of the supply chain issues improve. Um, so we like our odds. Um, you know, specific to your, I believe your last question with regard to inventory, um, we've had a very consistent flow of inventory um, and obviously has resulted um, in a significant improvement in sales. So what the merchant team has done in partnership with our vendors to chase this trend that we're on has been a Herculean effort. Uh, could not be more proud of, of what they've been able to do and we do expect as we get closer to back to school will be in a much improved inventory position um, and expect the quality of our inventory to remain at the levels that it's at. Um, specific to the launch calendar, there have been some launches that have uh, shifted, uh, whether it be month to month, quarter to quarter. I wouldn't say they've been any more frequent than what we've seen historically. We always deal with changes in the launch calendar. Um, so some of that is, is fairly normal. Um, we have seen some. Uh, certainly due to the uh, impact of the supply chain, but uh, again, not a completely abnormal um, process that we've been through in the past. Perfect. That's really helpful. Um, and then it sounds like you saw a positive impact from competitor closures and, uh, you know, limited vendor distribution, more limited vendor distribution in the quarter. Can you maybe maybe give us some more detail, you know, on that particularly, and then um, maybe an update on the market share opportunity? Since I think the last time you said it was sort of twenty to forty million dollars of an annualized benefit, but that just included Stage and J.C. Penney, and I think there's been, you know, a few other public companies that come out and publicly said they're losing access to Nike products. So, just just wondering if you could sort of give us an, an update there. Yeah, it's Jared again. I mean, certainly there's lots of uh, marketplace changes, whether it be from closures or whether it be from changes in distribution strategy um, by a number of our partners. Um, you know, what we've seen initially 
with regard to Sage and JC Penney, um, is that those stores that did have a closure in their market um, are performing um, better than our average. So very, very pleased with what we've seen from that so far. Um, there are more that will occur, um, certainly as we go throughout this year, um, but some of that's in the early innings. Um, we need to get to a point where inventory completely flushes out of some of those um, banners that maybe are losing distribution, and we certainly see that as a significant opportunity for us as we go forward. Perfect. And then just my last question, can you just give us some more color on what is expected to drive the gross margin strength over the next three quarters? Are the expectations and the guidance for the promotional environment to remain fairly limited here? Hey, Alex, Jared, again. Uh, yeah, we do expect that the promotional environment should be limited. Um, you know, lots of conversation around um, a cadence back to normal. Not quite sure what normal means um, today. So, but based off the health of inventory in the marketplace, a lot of the distribution you know, changes that are occurring, certainly the health of our inventory, um, as we're at record level uh, lows in the aged inventory, um, we would expect the promotional activity to remain fairly low. Perfect, that's really helpful. Best of luck going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. As a reminder, via the phone lines, you may press the one followed by the four if you'd like to register a question or comment. The next question comes from Peter Benedict of Baird. Please go ahead. Hey, good, good morning, guys. Um, so first, just following up maybe on that on that last question, um, or part of the last question, um, the typical season, we understand that there's very little that's typical of what's uh, right now. Um, but seasonality would suggest that you're, you know, the second quarter revenues are down I don't know, anywhere north of 20% sequentially versus 1Q. And I'm, I'm just, that would imply like a mid-teens comp decline. Now, I know you're not giving guidance, but I'm just trying to understand, given what you see, is there, is, um, is there any sign that we're going to be maybe following normal seasonality, or are we just still at, 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 at trends that uh, make those kinds of analyses kind of worthless in the short term? That's my first question. <laughs> hey, Peter. Um certainly hard to predict. I don't know if I would call them worthless, certainly uh, an input um, in to try to understand what that cadence is. Um, the things that we're most excited about, obviously, we're up against, you know, a big quarter and certainly very healthy numbers, but, you know, Mike referenced all the improvements that we've made um, across the company, uh, thrilled with the access that we've seen with regard to new customers, um, and we really do feel that the build of inventory is going to significantly help us as we go through and get closer into back to school. Uh, so certainly lots of questions around timing. Um, you know, will it be a normal back to school? We certainly believe it'll be a, a significantly better back to school than a year ago. When that will occur, still somewhat unsure, um, but really confident in the improvements we've made across the company, really proud of the improvements we've made within merchandising, connecting to our consumers. Um, but certainly know that it is a big number that we're up against. And you know, modeling yeah. out um, some of those month by month cadence, quarter by quarter cadence, um, very difficult at this point with uh, the information being so drastically different than what we've seen historically. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fair. You guys have done a great job here. But um, I guess uh, shifting to, to, to gross margin, just curious, uh, any color on Kind of just how that, those product margins performed in 1Q versus uh, versus maybe occupancy, um, and it sounds like uh, you guys don't expect too much promotional activity to return, which makes sense given the inventory situation. But just wanted to confirm that that y your outlook doesn't really assume promotions and markdowns kind of get back to anywhere near normal uh, over the balance of the year. Yeah, Peter, it's it's Bob. Um, again, I think we we continue to see strength in the product margin line. And obviously, with the sales volume, we've, as we've said multiple times, you know, we get some significant leverage off of the, the store occupancy piece. You know, as, as those sales numbers, again, are up against some tough compares last year, you know, there is a little bit of, of pressure on not only the, the product margin side as we start to replenish inventory values, but you get a little less leverage, obviously, on the occupancy as you move forward, too. So um, that's why I said we're being, you know, a, a little bit more cautious on what that looks like. We expected there to be headwinds, obviously, at some point. We've been 
you know, blessed to get through another quarter with a really strong, you know, overall gross margin number, but there is some, you know, concern that that number will, will start to, you know, drop a little bit here over the next three quarters. Okay. And then my last question is just, um, it, it, can, you, can you just maybe elaborate on the investments in customer experience uh, that, that, you're, that you're doing uh, and also some of the supply chain initiatives you've been alluding to? Uh, I'm just curious, kind of any, any more specific, uh, specifics you can provide around that. Thank you. Hey, Peter, it's Bill. Um, so we have actually spent, hey, um, we spent a lot of time um, doing research, doing analysis, design and testing around what we're calling next generation omnichannel experiences. So um, those are going to be focused on, number one, our loyalty program, uh, making that easier to use, even easier than it is today, as well as more valuable for our members. Um, so number one, loyalty. Uh, number two, our launch process and our app. Um, they're very good today, but we're going to make those even better. So we have some uh, very uh, unique and industry-leading plans around that piece. And then lastly, around fulfillment, um, how to get things faster to customers. Uh, so those are three things that we're very focused on uh, around our next generation omnichannel. Yeah, I'll chime in. This has been, uh, you know, from the in-store experience, uh, number one, we want to make it fun for both our customers and, you know, and, our, and our associates in the stores. And so we've been doing a lot there, uh, inclusive of, you know, up, updating the stores through our refresh program uh, and our new store design, uh, you know, uh, upgrading the music that we play in stores, things of that nature to, again, you know, make it a, a compelling environment that you, know, you want to spend time in. Um, we've also done some things from a store side, you know, standpoint, obviously within training. Uh, we continue our leadership tra training at store level, uh, done some things with contests and SPIF, again, to, to just increase the experience you know, both for our associates and um, and our customers and consumers when they come in. And then okay, finally, this is, this is Mike. I'll talk about the supply chain for just a second. You know, it's, it's always been my view that retail is an extended supply chain, so it's incredibly important to what we do, and I'll represent what they're doing uh, today. Um, the three priorities in order of priority uh, when we started this journey were velocity, uh, then capacity, then efficiency. So the velocity, um, a lot of those initiatives are underway, and they started with frequency of delivery and speed to market. Uh, those have yielded great results, and you see them in the sales line and in the gross margin line, because I'll remind you, this stuff has a shelf life. And the faster it's, on the sh the faster it's in the store and in the hands of the consumer, the higher the turn, the higher the gross. Uh, the second part of that capacity was incredibly important because we expected to grow, and we have grown, and we've turned in a substantial amount of growth in a short amount of time. And so as a result, that capacity has become ever more important. So, for example, going from a five-day-a-week operation to a seven-day-a-week operation uh, by judiciously investing in things that uh, increase the throughput through the distribution centers as well as in the transportation side. And then third, efficiency always comes last because you have to be effective before you can be efficient. You have to be good before you can be frugal. And so uh, the efficiency initiatives are underway, uh, and they're all the things that you'd expect that we're doing in the supply chain uh, to lower the labor costs and, and improve the turns. So thanks. Well, that, that's great, color. Thanks so much, guys. Look forward to uh, diving deeper on the 24th. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Christina Fernandez, Telsey Advisory Group. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, and congratulations on a good quarter. Um, I have two questions. One is to ask first about the higher average ticket. Can you comment on what you're seeing as far as consumers either trading up or purchasing more items? Um, I would have thought with the higher apparel sales that could have put some pressure on tickets, so any color there would be helpful. Hi, Christina. It's Bill. Um, so a couple things. Our average unit retail, so the average unit's gone up, and obviously we have less clearance, so that's part of it. Um, also, the amount of units per ticket has also gone up, and that's a result of our focus on toe-to-head, so not only selling the sneaker, but the apparel and accessories that go with it. Uh, so those are two of the main driving factors. Thanks. And then the second question I have was the the quantification of the shortfall in inventory, the 80 to 100 million, 
I guess, was that relative to expectations or was that just your estimate of the sales you left on the table during the quarter based on demand? And do you, do you think you can recover that here in the second quarter? Thanks. Yeah, good morning. It's Jared. So that commentary was specific to inventory level. So certainly the the lack of inventory does translate to a potential sales shortfall. Um, so again, we feel like to provide the right customer experience, both in store and online, um, we had a gap of approximately 80 to 100 million dollars in inventory. Thank you. The next question comes from Sam Poser, Williams Trading. Please go ahead. Hi, I've got a couple of follow-ups. Um, just being built into the guidance for the balance of the year, have you has the twenty to forty million dollar benefit from Stage and JC Penny changed? Is the child tax credit built into that number to, to the guidance? Yeah, Sam, I think you know, we, we made a brief comment, too. We think that the, the impact of the closures of JCPenney and Stage was probably a little bit more favorable than we had originally anticipated. Um, we obviously have baked that kind of run rate into the future. At this point, child tax credit, just like stimulus in the past, we understand it's kind of it, it's, it's, it's a known item, but with some of the unemployment benefits that some of the states are, are going to be cutting off, plus the combination of when and who the tax credits are going to, um, we, we did really just did not know how to factor that in from a standpoint of timing-wise, so the estimate really does not include any potential impact of that. All right, so that actually leads right into the next question. So you guys have done, as you've called out, you know, I believe you've done a very good job of, you know, as you wrote here, you know, really improving your, I, I just call it consumer engagement, either on the channel, in the stores, and so on and so forth. That shows up in your results. How much, but then, you know, you're concerned uh, in, in the, you know, there's other sort of macro factors that are impacting the guidance. Um, how much did stimulus, do you think, help the quarter? How much of it, how much, um now, how much control do you guys really feel like you have as to what's happening next um, and rel you know, relative to the numbers you put out there? Because, yes, I understand the macro, but then, you know, you continue to improve all of the consumer-facing stuff, which appears to be driving business. And if you keep getting better, that should theoretically could keep getting better. And does that overwhelm? Like, how are you judging that versus sort of the macro headwinds you know and headwinds you don't, you know, that you have sort of built in uh, to, you know, in your commentary, both on the call and in the press release. So, Sam, you don't have any easy questions I could answer? Um, <laughs> I, think, I think it's obviously difficult to, to isolate stimulus. I mean, we've got a lot of moving parts, and none of these are mutually exclusive. Obviously, we attracted new customers, and some of them had stimulus money. We have existing customers. Some of them had stimulus money. Uh, you know, depending on when they joined us, whether it was, you know, second, third, or fourth quarter last year and why they came to us, there's just a lot of different moving parts there. Um, again, we feel very confident in the base that we are building and in the experience we are providing to the consumer. But, you know, clearly not going to run away from the fact that stimulus has a significant impact on our, on our results. The difficulty is when we get to a period where there's not some of these moving parts, what does that business look like? So, you know, again, I think we feel like this is a long game. You know, this is not something we're running quarter by quarter. We're looking at a long-term, uh, you know, opportunity here. And even though we see a little bit of pressure on margin and an SG&A in the back third qu three quarters of this year compared to Q1, we want to remind people this is still rel you know, much better than it was a couple years ago. So we think we've built a much stronger engine. We've built a much stronger base. And again, we can't really start to get into all the separate pieces because there are so many moving parts. But again, we're trying to keep that longer term uh, perspective in mind. Um, all right, well, I'll follow, I'll follow up on everything else offline. Thanks so much. That was our final question. I'll call back over to our host for any closing remarks. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending the call. Um, 
We are very proud of our team. Uh, we are very excited about our results, and that's enough celebration for us, and it's back to work. So we hope that everyone has a safe weekend while we honor Memorial Day. We look forward to getting back together soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. This does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines. Thank you and have a good day.